Good morning. So this is uh, our live surgery demonstration. So we have John Levy uh, in uh, South Florida today. He's going to do a reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty on a patient with rotator cuff arthropathy, uh, high riding humeral head. Um, and he's going to discuss uh, kind of his strategy here. You can see he's set up. So if you have anything you would like to say, John, go ahead. Good morning, Las Vegas. Uh, good to see uh, a few of you guys are getting up early. Uh, what we got here is, well, first, let me, let me just show you this. Uh, this is Holy Cross Hospital. We're in Fort Lauderdale. And we have a stellar team here working. Um, you can't see Chris behind the, the you can wait over, you can say hi. Chris, Chris is going to be uh, in charge of our anesthesia. He's already done an ultrasound by intercellular block, uh, which is a single shot. Uh, we Three dose of uh, the patient with um, transcendent acid, done IV, um, prophylactic antibiotics, so vancomycin and ANSEP, and um, that's all taken care of ahead of time. And uh, now, this, the, the assistant you'll see behind me, you can see a shoulder right now. But I've got several of my physician assistant. I've got an ACMO, my, uh, my current fellow, which is my right. And uh, the local NASA is going to be uh, passing all the instruments that we need. Uh, probably wouldn't have to ask for a single thing. So this patient is a 59-year-old gentleman who um, has classes for acute cluster arthropathy, massive tough care, scoopsia, migration, and humeral head, a little bit of chromium wear, not a tremendous amount of glenoid wear, but he's a very large man. Uh, and because he's a large man, I took the liberty of uh, just getting started a little bit. Um, but I'll show you kind of how we, how we get started. And, and Dr. Miles, certainly as we go, you can kind of comment as, as to how we do things. Uh, we'll comment that probably you and I probably, probably do things similarly. Go ahead. Yeah, the audience yesterday had some questions about transexamic acid. I see you said you use that. Do you use that on all your cases? Uh, in, in, unless a real unless patient has a DVT, or I don't, and I don't use it on trauma cases at all. But I use it as IV, I don't use topical. So. I do a, this is a standard deltopectoral approach. I've already uh, burgered a little bit of the biceps. Here we go. So, in, in anatomical locations, I go AC joint. I mark the AC joint, I go five centimeters down the clavicle. And my goal is to make a, a, a line from the anterior deltoid all the way to the deltoid insertion. So, what you see here is the deltoid. I've taken the cephalic vein medially the pectoralis major, the pectoralis major tendon, and I haven't done any release of the pectoralis major tendon. I then take a, a large sharp home and put it underneath the deltoid tendon. I have a Goulet retractor that is retracting the deltoid. And then what I would typically do is, is internally rotate and release. And I've already gone ahead and taken out a very large bursa that he had, which is classic for uh, classic rotator cuff arthropathy. And immediately what you can see is Put a brown deltoid retractor in there for a second. And this is a brown deltoid retractor, a very workhorse retractor because it will lever the humeral head forward. And immediately you can see that's the biceps tendon. It's hypertrophic and it's thick and it's flattened. And that's very commonly seen in cuff tear arthropathy. Um, my next step is to brief. So I've already developed my subdeltoid into my subacromial space. He's got no cuffs, so the subacromial space is wide open once you remove the bursa. And now I have to develop my subcoracoid space. And the trick to getting there is you find the coracoid. This is the coracoid bone. You go right, let's just, I'll try to show you a little better. This is the CA ligament here. I will slide my, my just a schnitt retractor right under the base of the coracoid and slide underneath the conjoint, and that can lever me forward. And then once I do that, you can actually palpate the axillary nerve. And then I will release kind of these adhesions that we see in the upper, just the upper part of the pecs, or what we call the falks. And once I do that, I can put a blunt homin retractor just in front of the subscapularis. And I tend to, if you kind of zoom out, you'll see I clamp things to the drapes all the time. And that is something that uh, certainly Dr. Frankel taught me many years ago. I can say many years ago now, because it's been almost 10 years since I did my fellowship with Dr. Frankel and yourself, Dr. Mile. Now, are you going to do anything with the uh, coracochromial ligament, or do you leave that intact for a reverse? Uh, for reverse, I actually do release it. It does help with exposure. And 
it, it actually helps you to, to uh, place the match point guide. So this is a case, you know, I did his other shoulder, and I can tell you that uh, when I did his other shoulder, if I was critical about how I placed the, the glenoid component, I placed it a little bit too high. And intra-op, I have record of, and memory that uh, when I was trialing it, I kept getting impingement. Um, and, it, and I wasn't comfortable. I had to make some alterations. And it ended up balancing well, but it wasn't exactly how I wanted it. So this time, I actually used the match point to plan. Match point meaning patient-specific planning to actually plan the operation ahead of time to try to limit the chance of me um, malpositioning, so to speak, the glenoid component. Um, so here I'm looking for the, uh, the, the sisters or the anterior humeral circumflex vessels. I see them. I will snap them. Sorry. Trying to get, if my head's in the way, just holler. You're fine. So we can see. So you, you typically ligate those on every case, correct? Every, every case. Um, and what I'll do here is kind of remove some of the tenosynovitis around the biceps. And then we will do a biceps tenodesis or tra by basically transferring it to the pectoralis major tendon, which I'm going to do right now. And I have a number one ethibon. So I will pull the biceps up. I will flex the elbow just a bit. And I'll throw in a couple of... Uh, a quick locking crack out stitch. So we really can't, you're, you're kind of there right now. We're seeing the, the back of your head. It says Levy, but um, I think, uh, so you're putting some stitches awesome. in. Do you use a number one? What, is that a Tev deck or what is that? It's an Ethibon suture. Now, do you ever give consideration to just release the biceps when you're doing this? Uh, yeah, sometimes, but... Um, I've had some people complain of some biceps cramping, and I never know if that's really related to, or not. So this gives me at least, I don't know, some comfort in saying that I try to at least save his biceps tendon. It adds another couple of minutes to the case, but... So I throw a bunch of locking stitches, and then I will sew it to the, to the pectoralis major. We got a great view right now. Now, do you now do you give consideration for release of the pectoralis major ever? Do you leave it intact? What's your thought about that? Yeah. So if it's really tight, I will release. I'm I'm big on trying to figure out what are the things that are blocking my motion, and so if pec is in the way, or if the lat is causing me limitation in motion. I will actually palpate it once I'm trialing and see what's tight. And, and sometimes just for pure exposure reasons, there's such an internal rotation contracture that the pec major is actually limiting your posterior retraction. So during glenoid exposure, I will examine the pectoralis major and see if that's what's causing tightness. And, and then I'll do it there. I used to routinely release the pec major, at least the upper quarter. But I don't know. I think I started having some... Um, post-op pain related to it. I don't know if it was real or not, but people would point to their axilla and say that's where they're hurting post-operatively. Uh, so that's, that's my two cents. There's absolutely no science behind that. I haven't studied to tell you since I stopped releasing the pec routinely if it makes a difference. But I don't release it unless I have to, is my, my current answer. Would you agree, though, that if you just release 10 or 20 percent, that's not really going to get you any more motion? You really have to release probably 40 percent before that'll... You gotta release, yeah, you've got to release a lot of it. So I just got rid of the rest of the biceps tendon. And now in this case, um, I'm ready to start um, releasing whatever's left of his subscap, which isn't much. So I'll take a large sharp homin. I'll kind of place it around the, bat, the, the humeral neck. And I tend to hinge this anteriorly. So I almost want the retractor. Give me a little counter traction. So I want that to hinge to create tension on the subscapularis. And you can see his lesser tuberosity is way up here. So he doesn't all the way down to the inferior portion. It's almost down to the humeral uh, ligament, uh, the humeral glenohumeral humeral ligament. So I will release whatever's remaining of his subscapularis. So, so looking at that subscapularis, it looks not that uh, robust. So is that something that you would repair at the end of the case, or is this something you would just leave alone? No, I certainly will try to repair it at the end of the case.
And so now I often will use a suction device as a retractor. Uh, this is a, uh, the in beauty. It's not just a suction, but it's also a light. So I have a headlamp on, which you might've seen, but this gives me some extra light. Um, I'm a little bit paranoid about touching light handles above me. Uh, so I think the less you touch them, drop the mail a little bit. The less you touch them, probably the less contaminants I think you in, enter. So I don't like, I like having all the light I can without having to touch right. and move Hey, anything. John, the uh, drape has kind of fallen in front of the, the shoulder. If, that, if you can, thanks. Keep talking, because we got a, a number of people that can make adjustments to help you see better. So on the preoperative x-ray, does this uh, have a large inferior ossified or is this uh, more uh, just the degenerative uh, large head, that type of thing? It's got a, a small osteophyte. You'll see it in a, just a second because I just got a peek at it. But he's, he's just a big dude. You can ask Chris uh, from anesthesia that uh, even innovating was no fun. So I'm just releasing the entire humeral neck. All right, we'll have you. Yeah, great. I'm going low. Now, are you externally rotating the arm while you're doing this? Not yet, but I am now. Thanks for reminding me. So do you make it a point to see the latissimus tendon when you're doing your uh, release laterally before you get going, or is that... Uh... No, because that means I have to release the pec. I mean, I, I will inevitably get there as I'm releasing inferiorly. I don't think I'm seeing it here. Yeah, you can see just a hint of it right here. I probably released a little bit, but that's the beginning of the lat right there. And so I'm just, to me, I just really need to get a nice humeral neck release. And this is all just capsule releasing all around the humeral neck. And I do like these. So now you're rotating a little bit. That's correct, just to get around. Now sometimes, I mean, I saw you use the Homan with a point. I like that blunt Homan sometimes. Do you like that at all? Just because I feel like it's like a shoehorn. You're about to, kinda... to see him. I'm I had about a to see him. Oh a... yeah, that's good. A... Yeah, my fellow called better. this littering the shoulder with Homans. So we're about to litter the shoulder with homans. And so what I'll do is I'll actually hinge around and then I'll almost grab it and try to pull the humeral head forward. And once I do that, we can bring the mayo down just a little bit more. And so to get perspective of how big this guy really is, uh, let me get one more large sharp. So now, this one you said was high riding. Do you, if you're going to make a head cut, I suspect next. So, are you going to take a little bit more bone? I mean, what are your thoughts when you're making this head cut on this yeah. guy? So, and that's a great question, right? How, you have no cuff, so how do you know where your anatomic cut is? And I always do an anatomic cut. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll, these are the osteophytes. So you see, there's not very much in terms of osteophytes. I can just um, kind of grab them with a, a rongeur. But in this case, I'm not even going to go crazy with this. I'm just going to make a head cut because the, the osteophytes aren't that big. But if they are big, what I'll take is an osteotome, and I'll chisel off the oste osteophytes kind of with an, a, a, kind of a slightly curved osteotome. But go back to your question, like how do you choose your head cut? I just sort of envision where the, the anatomical neck would be. And so I, I, this is the lesser tuberosity. Probably the anatomical neck sits about like this. And I'll actually do this routinely because once you create a little bit of a carving, then this guide, which has a 30 degrees built-in um, retroversion, it can slide on the anterior face of the humeral head and almost just sit in your groove of where you placed it. Um, and so I'm going to, I've lined this rod up with the forearm, so I know I'm cutting at 30 degrees of retroversion, to be and I'm just pinning it in. I could pin it, pin it in too, but I don't really think I need to here. So to be clear, the guide is a 135 degree neck shaft angle. Yeah, it's locking in my, my uh, 135 degree neck shaft angle. Now, are you going to give that tech to your, or that graft to your tech to make bone graft out of it on the back table? 
Do you use yeah, that? Yeah, although I don't know that I'll have to use either the. His bone looks pretty, pretty good. Gonna, the bone's really good. I don't think I'm going to need extra bone graft. Just kind of cleaning up extra humeral head that I didn't kind of release. So if you look at the humeral head cut, you know, could I have made that a little bit larger? I could have made a, bit, a slightly bigger head cut if I wanted to. Um, I think we'll, you know, we'll be okay here. It'll allow me to inset my component. But the reamer that I'm going to use for the Altivate stem actually will kind of ream this out and create a really nice capturing of bone graft that I'll use uh, more so than the morselized bone that I'll take from the humeral head. All right, we're ready for the glenoid. So, you know, the, yeah, I would say, you know, what's nice is what, I, I don't see much of a cuff at all, maybe a little Terry's Minor on the back. So it's probably going to be yeah, fairly so, easy. I shouldn't set you up, but probably should be fairly easy to push that humeral head posteriorly. So what I do is I used to go straight to the posterior, uh, but now actually I do a lot of my releases right now. Just cleaning up some. So uh, let me have a uh, number one F-bond. So this is that sort of sub-scrap, if you will, that I uh, kind of released. There's really not much to it. You can cut, tag. So I will, at this point, feel for the nerve. I feel the nerve, and I know everything above my nerve. I'm in the subcoracoid space. I got a little bit of the sister that just declared themselves, so let me get it. So right now the arm is just resting comfortably. You're not really pulling on it or anything. It's just on the mayo. Probing me? No, I'm not pulling on anything. I just, uh... go ahead. Sorry if I'm standing in the way. I just had a, the sister declared herself. And probing me? Do you use thrombin when you're doing these cases if you get bleeding? Yeah, if I get bleeding, then I can't see. I actually saw that vessel very clearly, so I just grabbed it and bovied it. All right, so back, back to where I was. So here I've, I've felt the nerve, and I can actually release everything above the axillary nerve in the subcoracoid space. And this is a great time, if you guys can see this. Let me slide this a little bit up. This is where I'll release the CA ligament. So here's the CA ligament here. Um, I don't mind just taking it right off the base of the coracoid. And that will actually help me kind of follow down. And I can carry my releases all the way down the coracoid. I like that. I mean, I, I like to start right there. I like to see the base of the coracoid before I start doing my glenoid exposure. Yeah, so this is the base of the coracoid. I've gone, I'm gone, kind of heading right down. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. You're probably not quite at the right angle, but here, I'm, I'll, this is the base of the coracoid. I'm kind of, I'm sorry, this is the tip of the coracoid, and I'm following it down to the base of the coracoid. And all of these, all this tissue that's in between the subscapularis can be released. Very safe area. It tends to be a bunch of bleeders, but you can kind of coagulate them as you go. I think we've lost the shoulder here. Yeah, I see they're trying to make some adjustments over my head. How are we doing now? Better. We're back. Okay, if you'll zoom in there, this is the, uh, the coracoid tip. Followed it down to the base. The subscapularis, or the medial edge of the subscapularis, you'll see pulling it, Nisi. So here I can release the remaining portion of the rotator cuff interval. So we're just kind of seeing the anterior glenoid peeking at us. I... Yeah, exactly. So at, at this point, let me have my anterior glenoid retractor. So this is a brand new retractor. It's actually a, a, a prototype. It's a very, very small, um, very thin retractor. We call it the Batman because it kind of looks like a Batman. But it's skinny and thin. It actually fits real nice, and it has a nice angle, so it doesn't actually hinge on the anterior cortex. 
a lot of the anterior retractors kind of hinge on the soft tissue. This will sit nice and flush. So what I'm doing is I'm taking it, almost using it like an Army Navy, and I'm pulling the tissue that allows me to put tension on the anterior structures and do releases along the anterior glenoid neck. And that's where I'm at right now. And I'm hugging the anterior glenoid neck. You know what's going to help? This is going to help. So you're sticking that right behind the coracoid? Correct. So I'm going to just staple this on for a second. Let me have a... So I like to put another uh, home and posteriorly at like the 9 o'clock position, one of those sharp ones. you ever do that? I, I will in just a second. I've actually, I like to do all my anterior releasing first now. And then I go there. I feel like you're holding back. I can't see in there. I think, uh, I think they must have some technical difficulties getting up to you. <laughs> I see just fine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, let's try, let's try the posterior retractor. So the posterior retractor that I use is the smallest one. It's a very skinny home in, and I put this at the posterior inferior quadrant of the glenoid. Come out with the... Let's bring the mayo up, and this is where the, yeah, you're going to have to come from the side there. I'm going to slide the mayo over, because I want to get as close to the shoulder as possible, and they see if you'll hold the arm like that. You know, what, what's interesting, John Sperling yesterday said that when he gets to this part, he actually uses a reverse trend Ellenberger, sits the patient up a little bit more. He said that really helps him. I, I haven't done that, but he said that helps him see the glenoid a little bit better. Have you, have you ever tried that? I mean, my patient is sitting really high up right now. Yeah, we're, we're getting a really nice view right now, John. Yes, exactly. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be taking out... Oh, we had a good view. It was great. No, it's good. No, I can see you're, there's a very uh, kind of uh, inflamed labrum. Now, right, do you so do here's it... the glenoid, obviously. Here's the labrum. Here's the residual biceps tendon. And I'm going to readjust Sarah's retractor a little bit more posteriorly. And this will help you see probably a little bit better. Potentially not. No, no, that's really, it, it, it's coming. It's looking really nice. So I'm just going to take out the entire labrum now. Now, I used to use the pickups like you, but I'm starting to get cramping in my hands by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so I use a coker for that now uh, when I'm pinching that hard. What do you think? Do you ever use a coker? I don't know. you got a few years on me, sir. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I do use, I use a coker. Uh, and a guy like this especially, I mean, when you're feeling like you're wrestling him. So I, I've spent a lot more time in the last few years paying attention on impingement points. I mean, it's, it's a real thing that I think, anything that could be impingement. And impingement points to me are both bone and soft tissue. And so I will spend a good amount of time doing releases. I'll do capsule releases in the posterior in the setting of a reverse shoulder where I won't normally reverse, release the posterior capsule in a total shoulder, I always do it now with a reverse. So basically you're doing a 360 release. A complete 360. Now, uh, looking, because the light's bright, is there any really loss of cartilage on this glenoid? Is there a little superior wear, or is it uh, pretty yeah, normal so looking? I don't know if you can see this, but I just bovied cartilage. There's cartilage down low. There is no cartilage up top. So he has the beginnings of soup here where we probably just got to it sooner. There's no chance of somebody coming on this side, is there? So what I like to do is I like to have an assistant pull down on this inferior capsule. I was just going to say, if anybody in the audience has a question, if you want to fill out one of these little things and bring it up, or I can, I can ask John the question. So right now, your, your hand's kind of in there, but I guess you're working. But where, where are you right now? Yeah, I'm, work, I'm truly working on the inferior capsule and the inf anterior inferior labrum. So are you going to pull a little bit up and excise it, or do you release it off the inferior glenoid? What's your preferred? So both. Right now, I'm just debulking it because there's just a tremendous amount of inflamed uh, labrum. Hold on. 
So I will do this sometimes in layers. I, I'm just so I can see better. I think sometimes, you know, when you pull that up, uh, when you don't do this a lot, I can, I can tell you when I first started doing these, it made me a lot more nervous than it does now. Uh, so sometimes I would just hug that inferior glenoid. Yes. So I don't know if you saw the move I just did, but I just take, take my bovie right on the inferior glenoid. This is what you're describing. And just hug the smiley face, you know. And to give you an idea, I'll take a cob for a second. I don't always do this, but I think you can get an appreciation of what we're doing here. Almost like you're taking a cob. You take a cob and, and you can, you know, free that. I have a little bit of labrum here that I just want to remove so I can see the bony prominences of the inferior glenoid. So we see you're working around the back. I said, I, I think for me, it's almost like a, a magical thing when you get to four o'clock back there, everything seems to open up if you're releasing that, you know, inferior labrum and, and the capsule. So I can see you're probably about six o'clock right now. Yeah, I've already gotten everything that I wanted. And this is where I'm kind of running that that release all the way posteriorly. I'm going to reposition Sarah's retractor because it's going a little bit high. Good. Okay. So now I'm, you know, I've already planned this operation, like I mentioned to you. I did a virtual planning. I used what we call the software um, or the match point system. I need to be able to see there. So for that, you acquired a CT scan and sent it and had a custom guide uh, made, correct? Correct. And I know, if we look at the actual guide, this is his scapula, or his glenoid, and I know that this guy's going to fit right there and position me, and you can see where I'm positioning on the glenoid. It's certainly on the lower portion of the glenoid. And I've designed this in a way that I can fit a 36 neutral and have that 36 neutral rest almost perfectly on a uh, scapular neck. That, you know, that's a, this scapular neck is not, um, it has a little bit of uh, horizontal become, before it comes vertical. So I need to clean off enough of that bone and any soft tissue that might impede my guide from sitting. So I'm taking a bovie on all sides of the coracoid where I know that guide's going to sit. So that's one thing with all these guides that are, are manufactured or you can order. If you don't release all that soft tissue, it can throw that guide off. So you got to really be careful. So that, while they're wonderful, uh, if you have a big chunk of labrum that you left, uh, it can completely throw off the trajectory of the drill. So I am going to just slide this on. And that's sitting just perfect. So I, I see Tom Norris in the front. It was uh, one of his partners, Dr. Kelly, who talked about the position, but really about 12 millimeters up from the inferior glenoid to uh, have your kind of start point for most of these reverse shoulders. So I think that kind of depends on, uh, all right, so I want you guys to be able to see this. So that camera's not in a good spot, but guys. I think you were going to say that depends on the it. implant you're using. I think there are different implants. It does depend on the implant. That's exactly what I was about to say. Um, so I realized that you can't see. <laughs> so once I have that guide in, I just come in. I think I'm gonna have you do my surgeries for me now, John. I'm just gonna sit in my office and uh, talk. Uh, this is great. <laughs> I can drink coffee while I'm watching you. So now is there a number that you're looking for with the, uh, this is a, a central screw device. So, I mean, do you wanna have a certain length of screw does it, does you can it... See. yeah i mean i've already planned this so that this is going to sit straight out the back so it's when you planned it what was the length that you got when you planned it you know, on the computer i planned it so it just stuck out 30 millimeters hold on i have to redrill that i think i gotta put the guy back on i don't think i got to that cortex no there we go i did i felt safe
So that is exactly 30. I don't know if you guys can see that, but right there it is literally at 30. Pull back a little more, sir. So he's putting in a cannulated tap, and the tap, there's a line that will take it down to about 30 that you stop, and then he'll take the inserter off, and then you can ream directly over the cannulated tap. And I like to get a sense of what that bite feels like. I'm going to take a Goulet retractor for a second. So what he was saying is he drilled it in, but he wanted to hand tap it at the end just to make sure it was grabbing the bone. And then for, for me... A little I like, bit harder to, to kind of. I like to see that I'm preferentially taking inferior bone off, and I, I like to see a nice smiley face of cancellous bone. Pull back, sir. There we go. So I've slid that cannulated reamer in, and now I'm going to ream. And I already planned this so that I can get 100% coverage. Bone loss, I plan it and say, all right, I only want 60% coverage. And uh, we did a, um, a mechanical testing study of this implant and looked at variations on uncoverage angles, meaning how much you need to have bone-on-bone -bone coverage. We found that essentially you need about 50% coverage before you start getting too much micromotion that might exceed, uh, pull back a little bit, too much micromotion that might ex exceed the capacity of uh, of, you know, 150 microns of motion, which is what you want for bone ingrowth, you want to have less than 150 microns of motion. So in this case, I've reamed for circumferential preparation. To give you guys a, a better view, see that, you hold the, that goulet for a second, just for view, view standpoint, a little bit higher. So what you see there, the inferior half, in, if you zoom in, you'll see this really nice. So the in Inferior half of the glenoid has cancellous bone. The superior half is all down to sort of subchondral bone, but I've abraded it. So this is an ideal preparation in my mind, what I like to see. And now this is all cannulated and I'm ready to put in my base plate. And base plate is just a simple screw that has four peripheral holes. Starting to get a bite right now, starting to get a real good bite. So now have you already uh, planned out your glenosphere size? Yeah, so I don't know if you guys can see if they can. I've already planned out my size. The question is what, what, what orientation should I do? Should I push it a little bit more or do I like that orientation? Well, I've already got good compression. But using that Surgicase software planning, I know if I can get the hole a little bit more, the, the superior hole a little bit more pointed north, I can get a longer screw and a better combination of screws. Not that I'm really worried in this case for this guy, but I, if I can get it, that's perfect. That's exactly where I planned it. So I pushed it a little bit more. Usually, you can kind of play with it a little bit, like a couple degrees, to change that. And you'd be surprised how that, how that small variation can alter the length of your peripheral screws. Or even the location. It might be, you know, you might be headed right for the suprascapular nerve, and you might say, all right, if I just turn it another 10 degrees, I can avoid the nerve. And you can do all that planning with a match point or a surgery case patient specific implant system. And it's really, really a kind of a great learning, learning curve. You learn a lot by planning it. So now, I've, you know, I call this out as a, more like a T orientation, and I'm going to call out my screw, screw lengths. And I, these are all uh, calibrated. In terms of the depth, I have a calibrated drill, so I'm going to go in the front. Yeah, we, we've lost our view now. There we go. That's 22. Clean that, please. I'm going to go to the top. So each of those marks is like the first mark would be 14 on that black. So it's 14, then 18, then 34. 20. So he's calling it off the. And we're going to go to the back. Great. 
Great bone. So do you think you need to put all four of those screws in? 26. Uh, good question. I do. I don't know if we have to. Thirty-four. The nice long screws. So, I, in fact, Sation's phenomenal on this guy, which you'd expect. One little tip: if you're gonna, you know, when you're when you have really good bone. You really have to irrigate out the holes because there's going to be bone debris that could potentially prevent you from getting your screws all the way down. These are threaded screws, right? They're lock screws. That's actually a good tip. So I, I like to flush that. I actually irrigate it out right there real quick because with those yeah. lock screws, the little bits of bone can sometimes uh, throw off the... Oh, yeah, they'll get caught for sure. This guide is meant to prevent cross-threading, but it doesn't get the bone out. I'll take the screws, and I put the screws in on power. I'll take a little squirt while we're while we're waiting. Here we go. I don't need that much. If you can get me the screws, that's great. What I've started doing a little different, John, is if I use this device, I just put a 14 anterior and posterior and open those up before I start. And uh, the superior and inferior screws are the longer ones. Sure. I mean, in this case, I think you could do anything. I happen to get great length of screws on the front and the back in this case, so why not have a longer screw if I can get it? We'll go with 36 neutral. So you said this guy's really, really a, a big, huge guy. Do you ever consider doing something like a 40? Would that be something you would contemplate? It could be. He had such a great, you know, he has a really good result with a 36 on the other side. Um, but a 40, the only problem with you, you get with a 40 is you only have four millimeters of offset, lateral offset with the 40, 40 neutral. The 36 gives me six millimeters of lateral offset off the glenoid. But yeah, the bi really big patients, I, I do think about larger sizes. Like, you might, you might say this guy's a primary cuff tear arthropathy patient. Why aren't you using a 32 neutral and getting 10 millimeters of offset? And my answer is he's really big and I want to occupy more of his volume just so he doesn't have any instability. He had a large voluminous bursa. I think his delta is probably a little bit more stretched out and I don't want to undersize him too much. You're, you're getting very little bleeding. It's really nice. Is the pressure like 60 over 40? This is, yeah, this is actually a cadaveric. No, <laughs> no that's a, you know, maybe that's the transamic acid. Maybe it's my anesthesiologist. Um, I doubt it's my surgical technique. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, all that. I'm, I do try to get hemostasis as quickly as possible as I go, and I... I really pay attention to anything that might potentially bleed, and I get it right away. So you didn't see the initial approach, but I will take my time in my deltopectoral approach. And any little tributary that comes from the, the deltoid, you know, from the vein of the deltoid, I will take my time and coagulate those. I think that's a really important uh, step at avoiding hematomas postoperatively. So now I've basically got my uh, glenoid base plate, uh, base plate in. Now I'm getting ready to prepare... Um, trying to get you a retractor of some kind, just so you can see. So now you got a pretty good view of the glenoid. I'm going to come in and do what we call calcar reaming, which is just planing. And what I need to make sure is that there's no bony overhang that might prevent my Morris taper from engaging on the glenoid base plate. So let me have a quick irrigation. This is where I use a burr. Burr, please. So this is great. I mean, I've, I've sort of planned this out so that the bottom of a 36 will sit flush to the bottom of the glenoid, which, which I didn't do on his other side, but I think I got it here. So you look, 
you know, the, this is a 26 millimeter base plate. And so 36 gives me an extra five millimeters of radius, which is about what I have between the bottom of the, of the, uh, the base plate and the bottom of the glenoid. So you're just burying down that last little bit of bone. I want to I want to say that your uh, first assistant is doing an absolutely wonderful job because I haven't seen her headbutt you once. Uh, so I want to uh, congratulate her. She's doing really nice. It's her first time today. <laughs> no, it's you know if there's a uh, here's a little push for PAs. Sarah's been with me for nine years. She knows how I think. She knows all my next moves um, and. You, you know, you may get that with a surgical assist that you'll find over the years, but to have someone that can go to your office with you and uh, know the patients in and out, and uh, it's just an invaluable addition to practice management. And I know that's not what we're talking about, but you brought it up, so it's a, it's a really important part of my practice. I'm a firm believer. All right, we're ready for the uh, the 36. So what I do before I put in any uh, glenospheres or any Morris taper, I always like to dry the Morris taper. You don't want any fluid in there if you can avoid it. And then one nice aspect of the system is we have this nice clever inserter, so I have full leverage. And in a patient that might have trouble kind of getting that back, it's really not an issue at all. I'll give it a little tap. My hands are a little wet, but... And then I will give a nice impaction. We will test it out. So I think that's a very important step, what he's doing right now, because it, you'll just double check. He's going to pull back on it to make sure that doesn't disengage from the Morris taper. But, you know, I, I, I'll and say probably. Yeah, yeah, the system actually has a few. There's, there's one more step, and that's this step. So this is a, a kind of a pants over vest extra retention screw. But the tolerance between the head and the actual hole is very small. So if, if you start squeaking when you're putting this in, you've cantilevered the Morris taper. I will pull it out at that point. This went in smooth with no squeaking. And that means the Morris taper is very much lined up and the Morris taper is engaged. So base plate's in. It sits really nice. It's exactly on the inferior lip of the glenoid, which is where I want it in this case. So that really... Um, the match point system helped me to get there. That was the reason that I used it in this case, and I think it really worked. For now, bring in the humeral head. And this is an important tip. Don't just yank the shoulder and start rotating, because you've got to get the head in front of the glenosphere. So I will put my finger underneath the humeral neck, and I will deliver the shoulder forward. And now the humeral head is actually sitting in front of the glenosphere. Then I'll put my brown deltoid in. And before I have anybody drop the mayo, which is the next step, I will put in an inferior retractor on the humeral neck so I have leverage. And I'm literally lifting up and holding and supporting the shoulder with my left arm under the humeral neck. I'm grabbing the patient's arm with my right hand, and now we can drop the mayo. And by doing that, I have full control. You can go down a little bit more. He's a big guy. Good. And so now I will litter the humerus once again with, with Homans. Perfect view. Good. Now I'll take the, what we call the clue piece. So what you're going to see is the Ultivate stem. It's a brand new press fit stem. So where do you put this? I tend to hug this a little bit higher because I want the edge of the shell to sit as close to the, the top as possible. And I might even go a little bit higher. But that's sitting nice and pretty close to flush where I want it. Drill in the center guide. And then we have uh, a guided retractor. I call it something different because to me, that looks like something different. So this is an inset device, so you're milling out the proximal carriage of the humerus. And there's, this is great bone. Look at the bone graft in there. So we will use that bone graft when we are, uh, we can get some bone graft from the head for the hole. So now I've really prepared 
And this actually underprepares the shell by a millimeter. So if the outer diameter is, let's say, 42, that just reamed it to about a 41. So I can get a press fit on the, on the rim of the shell. The shell is completely intact. And now I just want to sound out my canal. I know on this other side I put in a 12. So I'm going sequentially. What was this? OK. And we'll go 12. And then I'm going to go straight to the 12. Uh, the, uh, wait, that was, that was what? That was 10? And then this is 12. And then I'll go straight with the 12 brooch. So you can see this line actually lines up with the top of the greater tuberosity for a standard. And I could probably keep going, but I think his bone is so good that I'm going to rely on the rim fit and get him a tapasil fit. So what I've done here is I've assembled a brooch to a shell. Now, there's a variety of different techniques that you can do with this instrumentation. But to me, this is just the way I like to do it, where I'm going to kind of get a sense of where this is going to sit. I'm lining up the forearm with the arm. Now, did you take the 12 brooch, or did you take a smaller brooch when you did this? This is a 12. So what is the thickness of your insert? That's a four millimeter? Standard. 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 You'll see from the side, it's just a standard size. And the trials are line to line with the preparation. So you still haven't ruined your potential for press fit on the rim. So in terms of my trialing, I want to make sure I've got motion. If you unzoom, you're going to see what kind of motion he has. Pull out and do it. So it's get, yeah, get a broad view. So first, I want to make sure there's no coaptation. I can rotate fully. I'm not coaptating. What I mean by that is impinging on the posterior glenoid and gapping open. I'm not seeing any of that through a full arc of rotation, of, of external rotation. Now I'm going to bring the arm up to forward elevation. And I mean, he's got easily 140 degrees of elevation. You know, it's really excellent range of motion. Now let's talk about stability. So in terms of stability, I want to be able to kind of gap open. You can zoom into the humerus for a second for this part. Keep it coming, keep it coming. So I want to and zoom in all the way. So I want to be able to try to. That's a little bit too zoomed. OK, you can see that. So I want to, oh, you had it. So I want it to gap open just a little bit like you saw. A little bit of gapping. I want to bring the arm into internal rotation, extension. I want to do an anterior drawer and not have it pop out. So this is very stable. I'm very pleased with the range of motion and the stability. I'm taking these parts. Large charpoman. Blunt, blunt, blunt. We'll, we'll probably just trial it one more time. Is this the same size you used on the other side? Uh, yeah, I used a 12, 36, neutral. Actually, on the other side, because I didn't drop the, like I kept the glenoid component a little, like the base plate's a little bit high. In that case, I um, ended up with a plus four semi-constrained, because it didn't balance just quite well. Good. I'm going to put my sutures in now. Let me have a drill. And I'll just do four sutures up and down. I mean, he's not, he doesn't have great subscap, so I'm not going to start way up here. I'm just going to start a little bit lower. And I may end up pulling some of these out if I have to. Got it. To me, it's interesting. Every surgeon seems to have their own little suture technique at the end of the case that they uh, kind of 
make part of their yeah, routine. And then you have, then you have guys. Like, I don't know if Howard Routman's out there, but you have guys like Howard who would say, "What am I doing with this stuff?" Saying I should never repair the subscapularis. I don't know if Howard's there or not. I think he said he was going to be there. Howard's saying bad things about you right now. No, um, the uh, yeah, we we talked about that a little yesterday, and I mean, actually, there's some new studies coming out looking at um, the advantages of repairing the subscap, and I think pretty much it's a lot design uh, specific too. Certain designs probably uh, sure. you can repair it. And then for me, at least when I was reading the initial French studies, they had a huge number of hematomas, uh, and so I think they didn't fix anything. I, I, I think it does diminish your dead space. Yeah. I lost my whole... So are you going to put that bone, have you decided, is this bone rock solid or are you going to put some bone graft in? I'll probably put a little bit of bone graft. I might need to drill that because oh, I can't find my hole. Let me just drill it. Yeah, I was trying to be a hero, draw for it once, and uh, then I forgot where I put my drill pathway. What uh, is the material of those sutures? This is, uh, it's called, it's a striker version called force fiber. It's a high tensile you know, a similar group to Max Braid, you know, those types of features. All right, so got some bone graft. This is the Altivate stem. The Altivate stem has a bone graft hole. I will now fill that bone graft hole uh, with some of the morselized bone that has been prepared from the head. And so the ingrowth material on this is a uh, what exactly? Can you tell tell us about it? Yeah, so yeah, it's a it's what the the name brand is P squared, which is a uh, variation on trabecular ingrowth metal. Actually, very well studied and been used in the hip now for a little while with with great success. So I actually do it so it kind of stands out a little bit on both sides. You can see it there. It's kind of sticking out, maybe adding a little bit of a press fit component. I am going to put a little bit of bone graft. Hold that there and try not to touch the implant. Great. So I'm kind of putting some graft in. This is the way I've always done. So this is like black and tannish, if you will. And then you got this great slurry bone. I call it slurry. This came out of that reamer. And this is the material you get from that reamer. It's just really phenomenal bone graft. That looks nice. Bob, Bob Kofold used to describe this as God's own glue. So I loved when he said that. <laughs> now I see you're going to do an in, in situ trial one more time. Is that... Yeah. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. Excellent. Oh, I took off the shell. Why did I take off the shell? So we'll do one more trial. It should be just perfect. But we'll do it one more time just for the sake of demonstration. Let me have a quick squirt. Get some of the extra bone graft. Let's squirt it out. Come around, let it come out, hold that, perfect, open the part, he's a young guy, I'm going to use E-Poly, he's 59 years old. Um, do you ever assemble, the, uh, assemble it on the back table and insert it as a unit, or do you like to use the alignment rod when you put it in? I, li I still like the alignment rod, I think that gives me a little bit more control of version and making sure I put it where I want to put it. Short irrigation. So I don't know if you see, one of the nice features of this stem is, it, you know, when you plan for revisions, you like to know you can get the thing out. And so, yeah, P-squared could be really hard to, to get to. 
with an impact monoblock shell, but these slots allow you to slide an osteotome down the middle. But you can disrupt any of the bone ingrowth between the actual stem and the humerus. So it looks like you're using a uh, vitamin E impregnated polyethylene. Is that correct? That is correct. He's 59 years old. I don't use it in my 80 year old. Good. Always check to make sure it's down. Look at all 360 degrees. Good. Let me just get a rongeur. I've got a little bit of this bone underneath here. I like it. That thing isn't moving. The whole humerus moves. You're just that checking for so this, stability. This is an example, really, of, you know, you can get press fit. Come on. So you can get a press fit from a lot of different ways, right? You can get a press fit from the diaphysis, which I will do in my 80-year-old. But in a guy like this who's got great bone, you can get a press fit from the metaphysis. And, and that's kind of what I did here. I mean, you'll look at his post-op x-ray. And you'll think that humerus is, is floating, but it's really, uh, hold that. It's really getting the press fit up top. And with that bone ingrowth component, um, with the you know, ingrowth metal, I'm, I'm really not concerned here. So we're uh, approaching our uh, 8 o'clock hour. You did very well, John. I didn't want to hurry you while you were doing that, but uh, very well done. Uh, uh, as, as usual, you do a wonderful job. Um, so we're going to be moving into our instability, but I do have a couple questions uh, from the audience. Go for it. Um, so they, they asked you, it said, um, in this case, this question is, it seemed that you had some difficulty locating the hole with the depth gauge. Uh, how could you be sure now, in no, terms uh, of... That, that, yeah, I know the question. So that when I was, how do I know that I'm following my pathway? Correct. Yeah, it, it, I was just, my angle was off because the humeral head was bouncing me, but I found it pretty confidently, and um, I don't think that, you know, it's a bicortical purchase, and a guy like this, a bone graft, bone is really, really strong. I have yet, in any of the reverses that I've done, um, found a case where I've sort of missed it, you know? Yeah, I think you can feel like, that with the tap, right? It's like I mean, doing any fracture work. You know, once you drill, you just got to find the other cortex. So what you would say is that if you missed the hole, the tap would have not engaged. Co correct. And that's, you know, one of the advantages of tapping it is you get a sense to feel not only the quality of your bone when you're put advancing the tap, but also whether you get to the other side. And uh, they go hand in hand because you should feel a strong bite. Anybody else have any questions before we wrap this up because we have to move on? John, we want to thank you very much. A wonderful job. Okay. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for moderating.